So without further ado, I need me with Durant Ashmore. Thank you, I just see everybody here. Um, Al Futrell was giving me the third degree when I walked in, you know, who are you? And, uh, I'm just a regular guy, I'm a layman, you know. Um, I'm an historian, I'm a student of history. I'm a compiler of history. I don't do actual research, but I do preservation. But I've just studied history my entire life and I love history. And, you know, there's two sayings that I kind of go by. Those who don't know history are bound to repeat it. And I firmly believe that. And unless you know where you've been, you can't tell where you're going. You don't know where you're going. So those are two kind of thoughts and ideas that I've had all along. And, uh, you know, just really enjoy the study of, of history and the stories. And I want to relate to you tonight some of the stories about history in this particular area, right here where we are. And the more I got into this, the more I was surprised to learn just what a rich, um, tradition of history, particularly American Revolutionary War history, there is quite within 10, 15, 20 miles of where we're standing right now. Now, um, when the Revolutionary War broke out in 1775, there were no people of European descent in this area legally. This was Indian territory. Mm -hmm. The southern boundary of Indian Territory is 10 miles that way. The western boundary of, um, or eastern boundary of Indian Territory is five miles this way. And all along the boundary of the Indian Territory, the settlers built blockhouses. They built forts. Every 10 to 20 miles, there was a blockhouse or a fort. And it was the leading men of the area who built these blockhouses. Um, significant history associated with these blockhouses, which are gone now. They disintegrated, they disappeared. Um, 50 years after the uh, Revolutionary War was over, I mean, you know, that was just an old ramshackle building. Tear it down, use your lumber, build your house, something like that. So, you know, we've lost a lot of these. On block houses, but where they are or were is real close to this area because they were to protect the settlers from Indian um, territory. So, you know, what were these early settlers like? Who who were these people? And you know, many of them were Scotch Irish that came down from Pennsylvania because it was getting too crowded there. They came down with the Great Wagon Road. Um, the aristocracy in Charleston had their own rules and, and ideals and so forth. They were nervous about Indian uprising ever since the Yamasee War in 1812, um, excuse me, 1715, um, which was a general uprising of Indian tribes all across the eastern seaboard, but it was primarily um, classified as the Yamasee War because the Yamasees were right next to the Charlestonians. And um, there was, you know, great distress. I mean, plantations were burned, slaves were freed, can't have that. Um, and so the Charlestonians were worried about Indian depredations coming in from the back country. And so they started, you know, um, allowing for settlers to come in through ground uh, land grants and the Midlands and so forth. These areas were um, populated by people with land grants. That just you. There were still Indian dep depredations. Um, this area bordering Indian territory <coughs> was the end of civilization. Once you stepped here onto this area, there was only one law that applied. 
and that was you weren't supposed to be here. Other than that, it was uh, Cherokee tribal law. So to combat all of the Indian attacks and so forth that were happening, um, militias started forming. And they started forming based on, um, you know, where these blockhouses were. Also, all kinds of bad people coming into this area because it was lawless. So a movement arose, it's called the Regulators Movement, in 1760, in the 1760s, where it was vigilantes. Um, militia were formed, formed on the base of the blockhouses. If somebody was doing something wrong, they didn't like, they would get them, they would whip them, or they would take them down to Charleston in chains. So there was a Regulators Movement that started in the 1760s. Um, but it got so bad, so extreme, that another group came in in opposition to them, and they were the moderators. So, um, you know, it was just a, a banning of militia. At the same time, these militias were um, gathering together to fight the Indian depredations that were, that were going on. So they were Indian fighters. They were experienced Indian fighters. As a matter of fact, in 1758 was the first Cherokee War, where James Grant, a British uh, officer, took a force of uh, two to 3,000 men through Indian Territory. And this is from 1758 to 1761. And they destroyed numerous Cherokee towns. That was the first Cherokee War. Um, but still, that didn't end. And during the Revolutionary War, in this area in particular, what it was, was a war with and against the Cherokees. Um, that was the dominant factor in um, the first phase of the Revolutionary War in the upstate. In South Carolina, there's two phases of the Revolutionary War. The first phase is the American phase, from 1775 to 1780. The British phase started in 1780 with the capture of Charleston. That was a momentous event. Um, the biggest blow to the revolutionary um, patriot side occurred with the capture of Charleston in 1780. Totally changed the dynamics here in South Carolina. But during the American period, there were Patriot Militia versus Loyalist Militia. And half of this area here was Loyalist. And one author says a third were Patriot, a third were um, Loyalist, and a third could care less. Because a lot of these backcountry people did not care about what problems were the Charleston or aristocracy had. They just wanted to lead their lives. And the biggest, most overriding concern that they had was security. It wasn't this glorified ideal of freedom. It was security. They, the people around here went with whatever side they thought could give them the most security from the Cherokees. Now again, that changed in 1780 with the uh, British period. But during the American period, Numerous people changed sides. Whoever they thought could protect them the most is where they went. There are people, Revolutionary War soldiers, who got pensions from the British government and the United States government. People switched sides. Generals switched sides. I'm not talking about Benedict Arnold, but generals here in South Carolina switched sides with the fall of Charleston. So, um, you know, the, the effect of the Cherokees is what dominated life here in uh, the um, pioneer times in, in the back country. This was referred to as the back country of South Carolina. And it's so, you know, the Indian deprivations, everybody was worried about so much. Um, the Cherokees sided with the British because, for a couple of reasons, the British said that they would stop European expansion at the Appalachian Mountains, and the Cherokees liked that idea. 
they, they were all for it. And also there was an extensive training with the Cherokees. The Cherokees were training deer skins and um, medicinal herbs. Excuse me. Um, and it was a very profitable business. The Cherokees in return were getting cooking utensils, blankets, ammunition, guns, whiskey. Um, whiskey was a very valuable commodity back then. For everybody. I could tell you a whole lecture on the role of alcohol in the American Revolution. I'm telling you, it was that's how they got the militia in there. They got the keg of beer, or they have you know bottles of rum. That's what these militia meetings were. Let's get away from the life a little while. Let's drink our rum. And we'll march around the guns. I mean, that's basically nothing's changed. Um, you got no history to keep from the thing. And, and I'm a talk a little bit tonight about the role of alcohol and, and, and what it did. But uh, that's one way you got everybody to come to the militia meeting. So the Council of Safety was the patriot de facto government in the state of South Carolina. They formed in Charleston. Henry Lawrence was the president of it. The British um, governor, royal governor, he knew something was up, so he escaped to a um, warship in the middle of Charleston Harbor. He stayed there for the rest of the war, practically. Um, and the Council of Safety wanted to uh, curry the favor of the Cherokees, so they decided that they were going to send a ship of shot and gunpowder um, to the Cherokees from Charleston through 96 up to Kiwi. And that way the uh, Cherokees, you know, would be favorable towards the Patriot side. Well, there were loyalist or Tory um, leaders in the upstate who were alarmed by this. They wanted the Cherokees on their side. So as that wagon train was leaving Charleston and heading towards 96, a place called Mine Creek, 18 miles below 96, Patrick Cunningham and about 200 men seized the wagon train that was guarded by 25 men. No shots were fired. So Patrick Cunningham, who was a uh, loyalist leader uh, from the Long Cane community, has the shot in the powder, and he escapes this way. The um, Patriot forces thought he was at 96. So they mustered an army of 500 men to invest 96. Well, the Patriots, they didn't want, they, excuse me, the Loyalists, they didn't want the Patriots investing 96, threatening the chop and powder that they now had. They mustered an army of 1,900 men, and they surrounded the 500 um, Patriots at 96. This is the first siege of 96, and it was a siege that lasted for three days. Council of Safety was like, whoa, they got 1,900 men in the upstate, we've got to do something about this. They dispatched um, Colonel Richardson of the Camden Militia with 4,000 men towards 96. So we got 500, surrounded by 1,900, with another 4,000 on the way. Well, knowledge of this um, relief column gave cause to the Tories, and so they, you know, said, well, let's just have a truce here. You, you tear down your defenses and we'll go across the Saluda River and everybody be happy. So that's how that first siege evolved. But when uh, uh, Colonel Richardson got to 96, um, he was incensed that there was an army of 1900 that could be raised here in the upstate. And he went to capture all of the loyalist leaders. And he was very effective in the way he did in, in doing this. I mean, he, he captured the loyalist leaders, about 10 or 15 of them, Richard Paris being one of them. Um, and um, so he was really able to uh, put the quietus on the Tory activity in the upstate except for Patrick Cunningham, who still had the shot and powder and 200 men. So Cunningham wants to escape. He goes in the most secure place he could possibly imagine. It's in Indian Territory, 
where nobody from your, of European descent was supposed to be. And he camped in the middle of a cane break on the Reedy River. Um, the cane break is a defensive stand that the Indians have used for, for centuries. Nobody ever sneaks up on anybody in the cane break. The rustling leaves make way too much noise. You know, that's a place of safety. It's thick. You can't see through there. So uh, he's encamped in a cane break on December of uh, 1775, and it's cold. It's very cold. So they build fires, and um, they're burning the cane. This is river cane. This is um, American bamboo. River cane is what the Reedy River was named after. For those of you who don't know that, it's named after river cane. Um, very valuable plant for the Cherokees. They used it for all kinds of, of reasons. Made bones out of it, for built their houses out of it. But when river cane burns, it pops and it sounds like gunshots. It pops so loud. Um, Richardson got word that there was uh, Cunningham was camped in the wilds of the Indian Territory, so he sent a flying column uh, with Major Danger Thompson and 1,300 men, half of them on horseback, half of them on foot. They left from Hollingsworth Mill down in uh, Lawrence County, marched overnight, marched all night, and at dawn they could hear the shots, the popping of the river cane, and they could see the campfires down in the bottomland of the Reedy River, and they started to surround um, the, uh, the Tories that were down there. And right before the circle was completed, uh, they were discovered, uh, shots rang out, 70 of Cunningham's men escaped, including Patrick Cunningham. Uh, he jumped on his horse, you know, um, bareback and without his saddle, and they make a joke about his breeches as well. Um, I mean, he literally jumped out of bed and got right on his horse and, and galloped into the wilds of uh, Cherokee territory um, with 70 other men, but 130 of his men were captured. And this was the Battle of the Cane Break. Um, there were about four casualties on the Tory side. One patriot got wounded in the shoulder. That was the grandfather of is it James K. Polk, President Polk. Um, his grandfather got wounded at uh, the Battle of the Cambridge. Now, okay, it's 1,300 people against 200, and we know who's going to win. But what's so momentous about this is the people who were involved in the Battle of the Cambridge, which is the only pitch battle that has ever happened in, in Greenville County. Um, some of the most important people in the entire Revolutionary War were at and involved in this little battle in, in our neighborhood, about eight miles from here. Um, Thomas Sumter was an adjutant to Colonel Richardson. We don't know if he was at the battle or not, but he was involved. He may have been left behind at, at uh, um, Collinsworth Mill. Andrew Pickens was at the Battle of the Haygood. General Richard Wynn was at uh, the Battle of the Cambrake. Um, on the uh, Loyalist side, um, James Lindley, Captain James Lindley, was there. He was captured. His sergeant and his neighbor, who lived on the Reedy River in Lawrence County, David Fanning, escaped. David Fanning, if he had been a patriot, the war would have been over a year earlier because that guy was one heck of a fight. Um, he was involved in a number of, of incidents. Um, and after a while, he, he did leave this area and he went up to North Carolina and he had a very distinguished uh, uh, career as a Tory militia officer in North Carolina. But he was, he was from right around here. And I'll be talking about Captain James Lindley a little bit later on, so I want you to remember that. And also Andrew Pickens as well. Andrew Pickens was extremely influential in what happened with the backcountry and upstate of uh, South Carolina during the Revolutionary War. He was a superb Indian fighter. A heck of a guy. 
Um, you ever seen a picture of him? He is ugly. Woo. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he was a good fighter. Um, so uh, the the shot and the powder were um, recovered as soon as the battle was over, and it lasted, you know, maybe even thirty minutes. Probably over quick. As soon as it was over, it started to snow. So here we have 130 Tory prisoners we've got to manage. Um, 70 of them escaped. And they, they wanted to get these prisoners down to Charleston as fast as they could. But again, it started snowing. And the snow is probably more remarkable than the battle. It was so severe. This is called the snow campaign. It snowed 30 inches, 30 inches. And um, these were ill-prepared troops. The prisoners and the, the guards all were suffering. And it took about two weeks or so to um, get down to Charleston. Now, Richard Paris was thrown in with this group. Um, he was captured about five days before the um, Battle of the King Break. He was kept in a dungeon in Charleston for the next nine months, in chains. Um, this is the first European, recognized European settler in, in England, although you probably don't know what everybody does. But um, that, the snow campaign really calmed the loyalist um, activities in the back country. So the Patriots went through the area, you know, rousting any Loyalists, giving them a hard time, making them leave, making them leave their, their property. So where did these guys go? The closest place for them to go, where they're not going to be harassed by the Patriots, is the Indian Territory. So now this whole area right here gets flooded with uh, um, Tories, you know, if you're loyal to the king and you're a good guy, you're a loyalist. If you're loyal to the king and you weren't a good guy, you were a Tory. So that's the difference in a loyalist and a Tory. But um, that was that a pretty strong line? Strong line. No. Well, when they captured the 130 people at Cambridge, they listed everybody's name and they listed bad guy. Uh, <laughs> Prone to violence. Um, if there wasn't anything by his name, you know, he, he was a loyalist. Um, about Richard Paris, they said, uh, 96, he was at the first seizure, 96, powder man, he stole powder, Scofolite. Richard Paris was a Scofolite. Who knows what that is? Yeah. Scofolite is a um, white man or a Tory who dressed up as an Indian. Um, and there were a couple of reasons they did this. One is because for whatever bad stuff they did, they wanted the Indian to get blamed for it. But the other is they, they did want to be accepted into the Indian culture. So um, a guy named William Scoville was the first guy to do that, but he was a really bad guy. He just did it to blame the Indians. But uh, more and more of these Tories, as they moved into Indian territory, and again, they were here by the hundreds. Um, they adopted Indian dress. Um, so, you know, after the cane break, a period of relative quietness, but, you know, the war start, brown, start beating and so forth. The British Indian agents, Stuart and Cameron, tried to foment unrest among the Cherokees and the other Indians to start attacking the sailors, I mean, the, uh, the settlers. Because um, I was thinking about the naval battle that was getting ready to happen down in Charleston in July of 1776. This is when Fort Moultrie was attacked. So the British had an idea that they were going to attack Charleston by sea in 1776. And they were repulsed, of course, at Fort Moultrie, and that's another story. But at the same time, they were trying to foment unrest. Uh, among the, the Cherokees to again attack the settlers along the uh, frontier so that 
they would be distracted here and couldn't reinforce Charleston and that sort of thing. This is when the Hampton Massacre occurred um, in June of 1776. Uh, this is Wade Hampton, General Wade Hampton, Governor Wade Hampton, his great grandparents had a uh, farmstead on the Tiger River in Spartanburg County. And um, they had traded with the, the Cherokees, they knew them. Um, uh, Wade Hampton's grandfather and four brothers were out on a hunting expedition. They were at the farmstead. So um, there were like eight people there, um, the great-grandparents, other visitors or whatever. Um, one lady had an infant baby, a couple of women, there was a seven-year-old boy. Um, the Indians, you know, the grandfather came out, shook the Indian's hand, and he shaking me with one hand, and he was tomahawking me with the other. So eight were killed. Um, the little infant baby was swung by the ankles, head was bashed against the side of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, a seven-year-old boy was, was kidnapped or taken back to the tribe, and that's what they did. If they were seven or eight, five or six, they would kidnap the children um, and take them to live with the Indians. And two years later, at the truce of um, DeWitt's Corner, they, the Indians were supposed to give up all their uh, hostages. Um, or kidnap victims, and the little boy didn't want to go, but uh, he wanted to stay with them. But I think they took him anyway. There was a woman in the woods who witnessed the attack of the, of the Hampton Massacre, and she never spoke again for the rest of her life. It was so horrific and terrifying for her. Um, so that happened in June of 1776. In um, July of 1776, 11 days after the signing of the Declaration, there was um, the beginnings of the battle going on here. And to tell this story, I'm going to relate to you a um, pension application that was written by an eyewitness to these events. This guy's name is, uh, I think it's William Smith, but I'll be sure about his name a little bit. He was stationed at Kellett's Blockhouse. Now, Kellett's Blockhouse is just right down Fairview Road. Y'all know where Knickerbarker Road is? Just over the um, Lawrence County line. Um, a mile or two past the Lawrence County line, there was a blockhouse built by Mr. Kellett. And there were like a hundred militiamen stationed there. And these militiamen, none of them served for more than four months. You know, they were like, they would sign up for three months. And it would be during the summer, not during planting season, and not during harvest season. You can see the battles that were fought by the militia, and they weren't in the spring and they weren't in the fall, with rare exceptions, but there was hell to pay in the summer because they, uh, they got down to business then. Um, so, um, this, this militia man is at Kelt's Blockhouse. Now, his job, what they did for weeks prior to July 15th, was they went and buried dead settlers that had been scalped. 31 of them. 31 men, women, and children within 10, 20 miles of Kellett's blockhouse. Because another 20 miles, there's another blockhouse. Those guys would bury the dead people there. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what he did for, for weeks on end. And then on the morning of July the 15th, he writes, We met a Tory. What an innocuous statement. He informed us that that evening, uh, 300 Cherokees and 300 Tories dressed as Cherokees were going to attack Fort Lyndon. How nice of him to inform them of that. Can you imagine what they did to that guy to uh, have him tell, tell, give their plans away? So now, um, 
the people at Kellogg's Blockhouse know that Fort Lindley is going to be attacked by 600 men that night. And they rush as fast as they can. I think there was about 100 of them. As fast as they can, they went down to Fort Lindley. Now, Fort Lindley, again, maybe 20, 25 miles from here, um, it's close to Fort Lindley. It's close to um, the dam for Lake Raven. Anybody knows that area? Past Hickory Tavern a little bit. Yeah, James knows it well. Uh, James is from there. But, um, so they, they rush to Fort Lindley. And um, it's a blockhouse. It's a palisaded blockhouse. And um, 50, about 50 settlers had, you know, gathered there because they knew there was an Indian <coughs> uprising. Well, it just so happens at the same time that uh, um, Major Jonathan Downs and 150 of the 96 militia or Little District militia, the names changed back in, in Little River uh, District. Um, the names changed back in there. But Jonathan Downs has 150 of Lawrence County's finest militia that happened to be there with those 50 uh, settlers. As the, the group from Kellett's Blockhouse comes up to reinforce them for uh, the coming attack. So, what do uh, Major Downs' men do? Lawrence County's finest. They're drunk. They hadn't been drinking rum. They level their rifles at the reinforcements. What do you mean the Indians are coming? Finally, Major Downs got um, control of the situation and he brought the men in because, you know, Fort Lindley's not bigger than this school building by any means. And in a little while, 300 more show up. So there, there's 600 people in Fort Lindley in an uh, area half the size of the school building here. They were camped all around, but they came into the fort that is uh, palisaded and ditched for defensive purposes. Plus there were firing ports and, and all this sort of thing. There was a house there. The palisades were built around the house. Um, and luckily there's 600 Patriot Militia there at Fort Lindley. Well, at midnight of July the 15th, all of a sudden, 300 Cherokees and 300 Tories dressed as Cherokees surround Fort Lindley. This is midnight, and it's rare for midnight battles. Shots are fired. They start shooting back and forth at each other. Um, after a while, the defenders of the fort had had enough of that, and they made a sally out the front door. And they said front door. I was thinking gay, but they said front door. Uh, ten abreast, and firing as they went. And uh, that broke the attack, and the Tories and the Indians, you know, skedaddled after that. They found no bodies. They found a lot of blood. There were no patriots wounded. As far as grand... Um, you know, deadly events, Fort Lindley doesn't fit that bill. But it does illustrate the unrest that happened, you know, during that time. So the next morning, the Patriots um, formed a forage line uh, a half a mile wide and marched out of the fort, you know, seeing what they could find. And about three miles away, they came to a clearing that um, had 30 horses in it. And it had saddles and saddlebags and grain was strewn all over the, land, over the ground. And they started going through the saddlebags. In the saddlebags of one of the, horse, of the horses, they found the commission papers of Captain James Lindley. Now, I told you that they're attacking Fort Lindley. Captain Lindley, that was his house. He attacked his own house. He had been run off by the uh, Patriot forces. He had to abandon his house, but it was a block house. Captain Lindley was a, um, uh, 
like Justice of the Peace, that's what his title was, Justice of the Peace for the 96th District. He was a British official, and he was granted 200 acres that had an old blockhouse on it that was used in the first Cherokee War, 1758-1760. But here he is attacking his own house. Now keep in mind, he'd been captured at the cane break, he'd been marched down to Charleston, Little detail I, I left out. They released him in Charleston on a pardon <coughs> with, under the conditions that he would never take up arms again against the um, Patriot forces. But here he is attacking his own house. And he was also joined with David Fanning, who started out as a sergeant but was a captain at this time as well. Um, David Fanning was James Lindley's neighbor. So um, that was what happened at Fort Lenning. You know, there was a attack, it was repulsed, and the Indians and the Tories um, skedaddled back into Indian territory. But on the same day that that happened, the staging ground for that Indian attack was burned to the ground. And where that staging ground was, was Richard Paris's house. Downtown Greenville, everybody knows where the Liberty Bridge is. On the east side, the side away from Main Street, that's where Richard Paris's house was. He had a two-story clabber plantation house. Um, when Paris settled um, at the Falls of the Reedy in 1770, he used the power of the river for a sawmill, for a grist mill, he had a whiskey still, he had 12 slaves. They cleared 100 acres. He farmed it. He grew corn. Um, and he was a man of refinement. He traded to the Indians. He got 12 Cherokees drunk, had them sign over uh, 12 square miles of their property to him, which is totally illegal. He got arrested for it. Went to trial in 96. And uh, the result of the trial was, or whatever happened, all of a sudden his uh, son, George, who was half Cherokee, enters the picture for the only time in history. And Paris's property is deeded over to his son, George, who's from, you know, a Cherokee wife. I don't know what Mrs. Paris thought about this. But Mrs. Paris, now, she, she was sophisticated because before they burned her house down, they got three wagon loads of goods out of this house. And they know she was refined because she had petticoats. And she had bonnets. So um, you can't get much more refined than that here in the wilds of uh, Greenwood County. They, they auctioned off the contents of that house for 7,000 pounds. I don't know what that's value in today's, but it's probably, probably pretty good. Paris is in a dungeon in Charleston in chains. His wife gets thrown out of her house, his goods confiscated, his house burned to the ground. So the next time you're at the Liberty Bridge, as soon as you hit that east end, you know right there that's where the first recognized European settlement you know, in Greenville County occurred. Um, James Lindley disappeared for the next two years. I mean, obviously he was living up there going to Cherokees. Uh, the British captured Savannah in 1778. The British had a slight resurgence. They, they wanted to take Augusta. Andrew Pickens mounted a force to counteract the British movements on Augusta, Andrew Pickens, with a group of 200 militia men, took on 600 Georgia and South Carolina loyalists and soundly defeated them at the Battle of Kettle Creek. And um, during this battle, Captain James Lindley was captured again for the second time. Now at this time point, he was taken to 96, which was the seat of the 96th district government, and a trial was held, and five days later, 
uh, James Lindley, and I think it was four other uh, um, loyalists as well, they were hung by the neck. So that was the end of James Lindley. Um, but uh, um, Andrew Pickens went on to a, a glorious career. <coughs> One event that Pickens was so involved in was the Second Cherokee War. And the attack on Fort Lee, the burning of um, Paris's house, these are events that were part of the Second Cherokee War. And during the Second Cherokee War, um, General Andrew Williamson took a force of thousands of men and they utterly destroyed every Cherokee town, um, burned all the crops, shot all the horses, pigs, cows, um, totally devastated uh, the Cherokees and, um, you know, sent them into the mountains. And that was really the end of Cherokee resistance uh, in, uh, in the back country of South Carolina as a result of that. Shortly after that, 1780, May of 1780, Charleston fell, 5,000 troops surrendered. That was the biggest loss of American troops uh, until Corregidor in World War II. Um, and that changed everything. So Charleston is now under British control. In quick succession, Augusta, 96, Camden, Georgetown, all became British fortifications. Um, the uh, patriots in the upstate were totally despondent. Andrew Pickens surrendered. He said, I won't fight again for the patriots. You know, you guys have won, I give up. Andrew Williamson, who had just defeated the Cherokees in the first Cher second Cherokee War, he surrenders. So two of the leading um, militia officers in the backcountry, Williamson and Pickens, they gave up. Um, I mean, it was a dark time for the Revolutionary War when Charleston fell. George Washington sends Horatio Gates and an army down to take on Cornwallis in Camden. Horatio Gates, the hero of Saratoga, um, he comes down and he's fumbling around and everything and his forces run into the forces at Camden in a battle that was never supposed to happen occurred then. And Gates was horribly defeated. And after that battle, he could not get away fast enough. As a matter of fact, he, he rode three horses to death as he was escaping to Charlotte. Um, and that was the end of Horatio Dix um, in South Carolina history. The next day at Fishing Creek, Thomas Sumter was soundly defeated. So everything is going wrong. Could not be going worse. Um, the same day of Fishing Creek, Isaac Shelby was in the area. Now the South Carolina militia, they weren't around. And this is when the Royalist militia, they were getting, you know, recruits after recruits after recruits. Whoever could give the most security was who the populace went with. Um, so, um, Isaac Shelby from Tennessee, he's being threatened by Cornwallis and Tarleton and Ferguson and all these guys. You know, they're starting to send him threats. So he comes over the mountains with his over-mountain men. He's got about 200 of them. He teams up with Elijah Clark down in Georgia, who was a heck of an officer as well. Clark County, Georgia is named after him. And also some elements of North Carolina. And there were a few South Carolina militiamen around. But um, Shelby had a force of 200 men. And he heard that there was a force of 200 men at Musgrove's Mill in Lawrence County. And again, this is maybe 30 miles down the road. Um, of those 200 men at Musgrove's Mill, my great, 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 great grandfather 
at this time he was Captain William Valentine, was in the Tory militia. I'm descended from a Tory um, major. I'm also descended from a Patriot major as well, Major Henry Durant. Um, this is one reason I'm so interested in this history. But Shelby gets word that there's 200 militiamen at Musgrove's Mill. So he rushes all night long to uh, Musgrove's Mill. Force march, wore out. Well, unfortunately, overnight, another 400 British militiamen under the commander of Alexander Ennis um, show up at uh, Musgrove Mill as well. And at that point, you know, there's 200 of Shelby's guys, there's 600 British militiamen. Uh, Isaac Shelby had what's officially known in the annals, annals as, of history as an oh shit moment. So there he is with 200 guys against 600. And quickly they devise a battle plan. He has his men uh, chop down trees, shrubs, and brush and make a breastworks 300, can't remember, it's 300 yards or 300 feet long um, in an Indian agricultural field. And there's a road going down the middle of it. And uh, Captain Shadrach Inman from Georgia, now this guy, he's a hero. His plan, he charged straight towards Alexander Ennis and the 600 British militiamen. And he had about 15 or 20 guys with him. So they charged down and British, they, they started shooting and he turned around and came back. So they, they kept in their lines. So he charged down, and they started, and he turned around and came back. I think he charged them three times. And the third time that he charged, he was shot and killed. But he drew the um, British militiamen towards the, the lines that Shelby had created. And it was a hilly um, terrain. You know, Ennis was marching his men in formation up there, but you know, one of them would go in a gully, and so they would get behind the others, and um, you know, it was a rough situation. And finally, he had them stop and fire a volley from about 75 yards away. And um, muskets back then were not accurate from 75 yards away. Those muskets, they would go uh, everywhere like that. Shelby's men held their fire. The uh, Tories, you know, loaded up again, charged again, and as they charged, when they got in range of the uh, Patriot breastworks, they unleashed a volley and just wiped them out. Um, Ennis led a charge. He was about to break through, but he got shot in the neck and um, unhorsed. And after that, it was it was all over. And the most important part of this is. Really not that 200 of Shelby's men defeated 600 militiamen. It was the fact that the day after Camden, the same day of Fishing Creek, all of a sudden there's a really nice victory. It turned everything. And, you know, there's, there's a big... You could make a case for Musgrove Bill being the turning point in the entire revolution. Because that was the point at which the um, Patriot forces started regaining strength. Um, Kings Mountain happened right after that with Isaac Shelby, you know, defeating Ferguson. Uh, Cowpens happened right after that with um, Andrew Pickens in the center of the line, the militiamen. You've all seen the movie The Patriot. It's based on several characters, Francis Berry perhaps being one of them, but also Andrew Pickens and his activities at Cowpens, which led to a great victory. Um, um, so, you know, these, these victories, um, Kings Mountain, Cowpens, Guilford Courthouse, which was a draw, but uh, 
that was one thing that, that Green did. I'm not sure Green won any battles at all. Every time the, the, the British lost more guys. Exactly, exactly. He had um, tactical defeats, but strategic victories. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were saying in Parliament, um, in British Parliament, you know, with another victory such as that, there won't be anything left of the, um, uh, you know, the colonial army. Uh, we can't afford to win any more battles like this. So, um, you know, this this is what's happening here in in Spartanburg County, right over the line, five miles that way. Even though the line was changed in 1823. Um, 14 major battles. There were more than that in Lawrence County. Um, Lawrence County had uh, numerous, numerous events, and Musgrove's Mill was perhaps the biggest, but uh, that's what they had. Um, oh, it's 8 o'clock. Um, I could go on and on. Um, I have an inner clock, I think. I think I'll probably stop there, but I'll be happy to answer any. Oh, I do want to mention this. One thing I should have said in my introduction when I was introducing myself. I said I was a student of history and a compiler of history, but I'm also a preserver of history. And uh, one of the things that I've been involved in lately is battlefield preservation. And uh, I've been doing some work at Fort Lindley which is really neat. Fort Lindy was lost to history for 200 years. Mm. Didn't know where it was. Until a uh, Ware Shoals, I mean, excuse me, Hickory Tavern uh, historian named Roy Christie started looking for it. It took him two years to find it. Now, he only lived three or four miles from there. But it's clearly identifiable. You can still see the defensive trenches around there. You can tell where the palisades were. There's a well there. Um, and for any and all of you who are interested in going to Fort Lindley, I'm more than happy to take you. Contact me. I think you've got my information. I'll be happy to, to take you to Fort Lindley. I'll also be happy to take you to the site of the Battle of the Canebrake. Now, I'm going to be giving a presentation there on December 27th. That's the 243rd anniversary of the Battle of the Canebrake. And if it's cold and miserable, well, so be it, because that's what it was like during the battle. 23rd? 22nd. 22nd. Yeah, this is three days before Christmas, but if you got out of town guests who want something to do, bring them to uh, the Cambridge. It's going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we're going to go down, we'll be on the Hopkins farm, and we're going down to a place called Patriot Grove. The Hopkins have owned the farm since 1834. It's on the National Register. Um, we don't exactly know where the Battle of the King Break was. We're going to have my friend Jake LaFoy help us locate that as well. Some of y'all may know Jake. Um, but uh, in 1876, a hundred years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the Hopkins family planted a grove of pecan trees. They planted about 30 of them. They are unbelievable. I mean, they are 143 years old. They are beautiful. Now, a third of them may have crashed down. They're still, what's remaining is incredible. It's uh, Patriot's Grove is what it's called. And it'll be a perfect place to discuss the Battle of the Cambridge. Wagons or cars because it's a bit of a trip. It, yeah, no, it, it's, it takes four wheel drive. And I'll, I'll tell you, anybody who's got a four wheel drive vehicle with a, like a four or five passenger, um, you've just been selected to be part of the tour. Um, <laughs> Absolutely worth it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really good. So, uh, another site that I'm working on is uh, Fort Thickety, which is in um, Cherokee County. Um, this was the first introduction of Isaac Shelby into the back country of South Carolina. He came with his overmountain men. He had 600 at this time. There was a um, Tory captain, Captain Moore, who had 90 men that were ensconced in Fort Thickety, which was a block house uh, built in the 18, 1750s for the Indians. Um, 
So Isaac Shelby, you know, sent a flag of truce to Moore and said, you know, you better surrender or, you know, we're going to get you. And uh, Captain Moore sent back, said, I will fight to the last night. Uh, you're not, you're not going to take this for it. Um, there's no way. And the next morning. <laughs> and the next morning, Isaac Shelby marched his 600 men in a ring around Fort um, Dickety. So Captain Moore looked at it and he saw that, and so he had his moment. And he decided to surrender with that firing shot. Um, one thing that was important about that, even though he had 93 men, he had 250 muskets loaded with buck and ball ready to shoot. Um, but that was Shelby's first um, event in the backcountry. And just a few weeks later, he um, won the Battle of uh, Musgrove Mill. Um, but uh, you want to see Fort Thickety, you're welcome to. If you want to see uh, the Battle of Cambridge, you're welcome to see that. If you want to go to Fort Lindy, I mean, I'm up for taking anybody, anytime, any place, anywhere. Any questions? Yes. Out of the two questions, how did the title of 96 get its name? And then the family, the Keller family, seems to be prevalent yeah. today. Yeah. I presume those are descendants. I would presume that too. Now, uh, one thing about the Kelly Block House, again, on Nicker Parker Road, just right there in the way, across from where the Block House was is the Kelly Cemetery. Mm. So that's one reason why we know where the Block House was, even though we don't know exactly where it was. And it's been checked with the South Carolina Battlefield Trust. They got fantastic metal detecting guys, the best in the state. Um, couldn't find the exact location. But it was built with pegs, you know, peg construction. They didn't have nails back then. They did not have nails. Um, here's, um, Martha Washington burned all of George Washington's letters after the war. That was a, a big loss to history. We'd love to know what was in there. But George Washington's letters to his overseer survived. And his overseer was like his cousin or something like that. But when George Washington was being besieged by the British in New York, he lost four battles in New York. During the loss of those battles, he's writing to his overseer, I sure do want to get the Clappers boards put up on the south wing of Mount Vernon. Um, go to Richmond for nails, go to here for nails. He was more concerned about the nails for his house than he was about what the British were doing as they were beating his tail in New York. I mean, they just weren't nails. And if they had nails, they'd have melted them down and made musket balls out of them. Um, these guys were poorly equipped for battle. You know, most of them, they were supposed to get 17 musket balls for every battle they went in. A lot of times they went in these battles with three or four musket balls at a time. You know, that was the conditions. Um, how did 96 get his name? There's a couple of theories. I don't think any of them are right. I don't know. 96 miles from Kiwi, but you didn't. 96 miles from Charleston is not that either. Um, if you go up the Saluda, there's nine rivers on the left and six rivers on the right. And once you pass those rivers, you're there. Those are a couple of explanations I've heard. Nobody knows how 96 guys are in. How many miles is it from here? It's not 96. <laughs> Maybe more like 36. But then it could be 96 leagues or 96 rods. Yeah. Yes. Do you know do you know where the site of Hollingsworth Mill was? Yes. Yes, at the confluence of uh, Dirty Creek and Raven Creek, and which is only a few miles from Fort Lindley. See, all of these places and people are related and they all knew each other. And Hollingsworth the Loyalist too, right? Uh, this is where Richardson camped. I'm not sure if he was loyalist or not. Now that mill site has changed hands and names lots of times. Most people in the local area there, James, you probably know this as much as anything, call it Simpson's Mill. But the story is where Hollingsworth Mill was, and again, it's at the confluence of Dirty Creek, which is Little Oak Creek, 
and and um, uh, Raven, um, Lake uh, not Lake Raven, but you know the the creek or the river, I guess at that point, to where they joined together, and that was where they set a mill up. And the story I heard was during Prohibition, whoever had that mill or that property or whatever had a hog farm there, but he also had a liquor store. And he was using the hogs, the smell of the hogs, to disguise the smell of the liquor that he was making. And the sheriff found out about it, and he took a bulldozer to the site and just wiped it out completely. And apparently there's some traces of the mill races in um, Raven Creek, I think is what it is. But um, that's that's where it was. You know, but there's not much there now. Thanks to the sheriff. Yes. I've always wondered, did the British Army ever communicate or have any liaisons with upcountry loyalist militia? Or did they just leave the militia alone to do whatever they want? The militia in South Carolina, the loyalist militia, was horrible. I don't know of any battle that they won. Um, they lost at Musgrove's Mill. Again, Pickens, with his 200 million, totally defeated the um, loyalists with 600 at, at Kettle Creek. Uh, except for Bloody Bill Cunningham, the, um, I think the, the loyalist militia lost every battle they fought in. I told you about my um, great, 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 great grandfather who was a, a British major. He was at um, Musgrove's Mill, he lost there. He was at King's Mountain, he got captured at King's Mountain. And he was put on a forced march up to Virginia. He escaped from that, rejoined the militia. He was stationed at 96 during the siege of 96, the second siege of 96, which lasted for 28 days. And can you imagine, he'd just been captured at King's Mountain, and they, they suffered, those, those loyalists suffered. They held a trial and hung nine of them before they got tired of hanging. Um, so, I mean, he was ill-treated. And now he's surrounded by Green's men in 96 for 28 days with no water. Um, you know, that was very trying conditions and they had no knowledge whatsoever until Green's men just suddenly retreated that Lord Broughton was coming from Charleston with a relief call and they saved that garrison in 96. This was, Green lost that, he had to give up the field, a tactical defeat but a strategic victory because he realized he couldn't keep 96, so he retreated all the way down. And that retreat was a battle that was, was tough in, in, in itself. But I'm talking about my great, 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 great grandfather. He lost every battle he was in. He was British militia, royalist militia, but he was promoted after every battle. Now, maybe because the guys above him got killed or something. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Why would they more sophisticated? Uh, I mean, they hadn't studied the Romans. And, uh... Well, um, in the Greek battle, see the tactics that um, Pickens used and the tactics that Shelby used were from ancient warfare. And I, I meant to look this up before I got here. What was the battle in Greece where they charged forward and they came back and sucked um, the opposing army into, um, you know, this, this is a tried and true tactic. I don't know how sophisticated it is. But um, those tactics, you know, leading to a double envelopment, that's, that's still taught at West Point. But sophistication was not the calling card for these people. And one thing I really didn't mention and could have mentioned even more, the Revolutionary War was not fought under the rules of the Geneva Convention. I mean, it, it was, and, and this whole area was, was violent. 
You know, you would not use the term sophistication in any way possible here unless you're talking about Mrs. Harris's petticoats. Um, it, it, was, it was rough. Um, that's why they had to have the blockhouses, because they were marauding bands moving through this area. This is pre-war. Pre but um, uh, they had to band together for defense, but half of the people who were here were on the run from like Virginia or Florida or wherever where they committed murder and so forth. Um, the, the weaponry was very primitive. You know, when, when you have one shot and then you have to get out of the battle for another 60 seconds while you're loaded up again and you have one more shot, um, that dictates your whole chat, um, tactics. And the most effective weapon during this time was the bayonet. And again, it's, that's not sophisticated either. Um, once you saw a, a line of bayonets coming at you, you started running. That was, that was the best, best policy. Um, the communications, and you asked you know, if there was communication with the loyalists from um, uh, you know, the British authorities. There was some with the Indian agents and that sort of thing, but uh, it, was, it was hard to communicate. Yes? What was Shelby doing with 600 militia in July of 1780? Well, in he the was middle of South Carolina? He was threatened. See, um, the South Carolina had given up. Next on the list was Tennessee. Yeah, he, and he, knew that, or he knew that. Yeah, he knew that. Well, now, um, before Kings Mountain, Ferguson had written a letter to right. Shelby yes. saying, you know, if you come anywhere around here, I'm going to kill you. Um, and, excuse me, just the opposite happened. Yeah, hang your leaders and burn your houses. That's right, that's right. Um, also, a question. Yeah. Tomahawks used at Musgrove Mill. I understand that was one of the first times tomahawks were used, and the British had no time for that. I, I didn't know that, but I mean, I think tomahawks may have been used for a long time. But right, uh, they were really used, and the British yeah. had. That was like their response to bayonets. Right, but I do know tomahawks were used at the ring fight. Okay. Um, that would be. Th this was Pickens. You know, um, when he was burning the town of Tomasi, he saw some um, uh, Indians, you know, running through the agricultural field. So he gathered up 25 men, hey, we got to get them before they get away. So he started chasing after them, got in the middle of this big grassy field. And all of a sudden, 185 mm -hmm. Cherokees stood up out of the tall grass and started shooting at him. He's got 25 men. The Cherokees have 185 men. So what he did was he quickly formed his um, men into a double line circle with an interior line and an exterior line. And he would have the outer line fire while the inner line was loaded. And then the inner line would fire while the outer line was loaded. And the reason I know about tomahawks is because several times um, the Cherokees breached his defenses and got inside the ring. And those those were killed with tomahawks and bayonets. I just remember, you know, seeing seeing that one. So um, Pickens is fighting this way for an hour and 15 minutes. And as many battles as he was in, and he was in a lot of them, um, he described this as the most intense fight of his entire career. Uh, there were no casualties on the Patriot side, one report says there were 16 Cherokees killed, and another report says there were 85 killed, so you don't know. The relief column that came was led by his brother, but also in this relief column was um, uh, Captain Jonathan Downs, the hero of Lawrence County, the leader of the drunk militia. Um, this is three weeks later, after the attack on Fort Leonard. So um, Downs is, is approaching to relieve Pickens, and uh, he, he must have been standing like this or something like that, and a shot came. He was the only kind. A shot came and went through his hand into his abdomen, and that musket ball stayed in his um, belly for the rest of his life. 
But um, and I don't think he fought much after that, except that he was captured by Bloody Bill Cunningham at uh, Hayes Station. And uh, fortunately, he was let go during that time. Uh, unless there are any questions, I guess we'll call that an evening. I think it won't be long, but uh, maybe bedtime, some of it. Great stories. Thank you. Thank you.